I am uh, Dr. Kira Brandt Burakov, and I am an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at York University. And what programs, which classes are you an assistant with right now? Um, I do Indigenous education quite broadly, um, but I'm also a scholar and researcher of curriculum studies, philosophies of education, and research methodologies. Wow, that's amazing. That's so impressive. <laughs> that is so, so cool. I'm like, I went to college for two years for radio broadcasting. So when I hear people that did these big, like, you have a PhD. That is wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and so, Kira, what made you really want to pursue Indigenous studies and Indigenous education? Mm-hmm. So I am a Haudenosaunee educator and researcher and come from Tandanaga Mohawk Territory and uh, have a, a long line of very inspirational uh, educators who came before me. And uh, so really had no desire to <laughs> at least see myself uh, working in, in an institution such as York University. Um, but uh, knew that education was where I wanted to be and uh, fell in love with the opportunity to be able to teach and work with future student teachers and in-service teachers through professional development and now supporting them as they navigate their work in graduate studies and in graduate work. So it really just kind of uh, stumbled into it, but it's, it's, it's deeply personal of, of ultimately what is it that um, our future and current Indigenous educators need in terms of being supported in the landscape of educational research and, and being an educator in Canada right now. And then my, my other passion is supporting our, our non-Indigenous educators in this work. Um, there's a lot of hunger for Indigenous education right now, and uh, it's just such a privilege to be able to help them navigate this in, in a really mindful and, and, and ethical way. Absolutely. And you talk about the the hunger for indigenous education, mm-hmm. because I, I know in these in these last couple of years, uh, we've seen a lot of news stories come out. And I think it's showing many Canadians that there's a lot of Canadian history, in particular, indigenous history yeah. that we, we don't know about. And with this month being Indigenous History Month, Kira, we're so excited that we get the chance to talk to you, someone who is educated and has all this knowledge, because it can be so intimidating saying, oh, my gosh, I don't know about this. Oh, absolutely. And there's almost and there and there there is absolutely guilt associated with saying, oh, my goodness, I I didn't know. Yes, yes. And I think that acknowledging that guilt is is important, but it's also really important to recognize that, you know, sitting with guilt or making people feel guilty is definitely not the uh, intention of reconciliation, the intention of helping educate, helping Canadians to feel educated um, and, and confident to be able to navigate these spaces. Um, because at, at the end of the day, when we, when we sit with guilt, it can feel really um, limiting and I think disempowering. And so we can acknowledge it and then ask ourselves, okay, now what? Now that I know what I know, what can I be doing or, or, or where should my energies be directed? Absolutely. And when, when we're talking about wanting to take those first steps towards helping, towards getting educated on this history mm-hmm. and towards healing, where do you where do you recommend that we start, especially for people that like I'm out of school, I'm not going to be going back into school anytime soon. But I do know that there's a lot of education that I missed. And so as far as your your knowledge, Kira, where do you think when we talk about something, when we were emailing back and forth, the topic that came up is commitments and actions for everyday Canadians during Indigenous History Month. Where can we start Absolutely. I think that one of the most important places to start is, is start with local. Um, who are local Indigenous communities and what is the history of this place? Uh, do I understand that the treaty is that, that covers this place um, and how this land came to be about? I think the most important thing is Indigenous peoples, we haven't gone anywhere. Um, our, our connection to land hasn't gone anywhere. And yet this perception, I think, uh, that, that there's been a complete erasure of, of Indigenous peoples from the landscape is, is really damaging to contemporary expressions of, of indigeneity. And so if we start with the local of um, 
who are the, the local communities? Uh, do I follow them even on Facebook, for example? Could that be a place for me to at least start to put my finger on the pulse of what's happening? What are the priorities and initiatives and events that are going on in the community? And how can my energy then be directed to supporting those initiatives while keeping myself informed? I love that. And and that is that is a really... Social media is an awesome tool to, yes. to start... <laughs> kind of dipping your toes in. And and we're very lucky that we are right next door to Tyan Danega territory. We have the Bay right. of Quinty Mohawks. They are always running different community events, especially through this month. They have so much knowledge that we can just, we can go over and we can ask. Um, as far as places to go um, at, on Tyan Danega, like, um, if we're talking about going to those spaces, what places in particular? Is that friendship centers? Is that community arenas? Mm, I, I think I think a few considerations to, to take in mind. One, it, certainly still with, with COVID and, and health being the priority of, of our community, mm-hmm. um, we are really fortunate to have so many virtual events. And so when it comes to some of the different virtual initiatives, I do think start with um, our MBQ newsletter, start with our MBQ Facebook page and, and gain an understanding of what are some of the different virtual event, events first. Um, I think also that it's an important place for non-Indigenous, at least local non-Indigenous folks to start um, because it, in, it invites us to be mindful of what are public events and how is it that I can come be involved but I'm not taking away from community-directed resources mm-hmm. um, as compared to, I think, sometimes the assumption of, oh, you know, I'm, I'm eager and I want to get involved, but then you're actually taking spots or places away from community members that might have been able to access uh, some of these resources or experiences in, in a different way. So I think it's being mindful of, uh, you know, what is open to the public, we typically do have um, a, a powwow in August every year, but with COVID, that's really been delayed. So some of these different um, events and initiatives that happen throughout the summer are taking on a, a, a different lens. Um, I think also one of the most important things as well is recognizing that the legacy of Indian residential schooling has had detrimental impacts on our language and our language revitalization initiatives are severely underfunded, severely under supported. And so I think um, making ourselves aware of what are some of the local language revitalization initiatives and programs and how is it that, that I could be involved in their different fundraisers or their different awareness campaigns. That's incredible. There's so many ways that people are able to get involved. And, and I know it's it's intimidating at the idea of, oh, man, where do I yeah. start? But that's exactly why we're having this conversation like that right there was what three, four different, super tangible, super approachable ideas that, that we could all do. Whether you're looking to educate yourself, whether you are looking to share that knowledge and this learning with your kids, I think yeah. I think we're in a position now where. I don't have kids in school, but I do think that we're maybe in a position now where kids going through school are learning some things that maybe the older demographic didn't learn. And maybe even it's just as simple as sitting with your kid and helping them with their history project. Oh, my goodness. Oh, absolutely. Our kids, as you said, they're coming up as, as the next leaders and having that opportunity um, for that education that so many of us didn't receive in school. And so that opportunity is really two-pronged of, one, being able to come to them and, and asking them and, and helping them with, with what it is that they're learning. But likewise, also educating ourselves, being prepared to read, whether it's sitting down with a, a new book or through audiobooks and podcasts, so many YouTube videos and really arming ourselves with that knowledge and awareness so that when they do come to us with those questions or hoping hoping to really deepen their understanding with what they are learning at school, that we're also prepared to take up those conversations and join them on that learning journey. Oh, I love that. That is... Uh... This is incredible. Um, I'm. I think I've asked you the the biggest questions that I really wanted to ask you, Kira. Uh, I I think now is a good time to ask you. Is there anything that you would especially like to add that you think is important to highlight this Indigenous History Month? I think when it comes to even conceptualizing or or engaging with this understanding of Indigenous History Month, it, it is. It's an opportunity to engage with what is the history of this place. And what are the the legacies of this history? But it also is really important for us to attend to the present. So to not kind of 
I think quite literally like historicize the past or historicize history and that it's something that's quite far removed. Um, it's, it's the, the legacies of colonization, it's the legacies of this history that we can study that has direct impact and implications for our communities today. And so, yes, it's about history, but it's about understanding history to better inform us about context to make change for tomorrow. Um, and so sitting down with kind of history books or, or, or this, this image of, of the past can, can do more harm than good if we're not really then thinking about um, how does this implicate me? How does this inform what I can be doing now and, and what needs to change for tomorrow? Yeah, it's not just looking back at what has happened. It's looking yeah. at what happened, how is that created today, and how are we going to be better going forward every day? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much, Kira, for all of your incredible knowledge on this, for sharing oh, your words with us. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Emma. And, and, and thank you to just this this initiative to seeing this this commitment and I, I grew up in Tynanega and you know listening to all of these radio stations and um, rarely did I feel like there was an opportunity to engage with the fact that indigenous people are here and, and, and Mohawk people are here and so the the thought of getting the email from Kay and, and having this opportunity I'm like man like for for Bell Williams to, to engage in this conversation on, on uh, and uh, hearing this on the radio and likewise for time to make it to also hear like someone from the community speaking about this it's uh, it uh, it's something I don't take lightly I'm, I'm so I'm so fortunate to be a part of it